Hi, welcome to Whitecap, the Canadian Sailing Podcast. Today, I'd like to welcome Luke Ramsey to the podcast. Luke was the representative in the 470 class at the 2012 Olympics with Mike Lee and the NACRA 17 in 2016 with Nikola Gurki, where they placed 15th and were ranked as high as 5th in the world during that quad. Also, Luke won the 20, 2006 World Youth Championships in laser and is a two-time Pan Am Games medalist in the Sunfish class, winning the silver medal in 2015 in Toronto, just days after sailing at the NACRA Worlds, and the silver again in 2019 in Peru. He's also a member of SailGP Canada's inaugural system, is now headed to the Pan Am Games in the Lightning class. Luke, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm a pretty big geek when it comes to Canadian sailing history, and I'd say in this century anyway, among Canadian men's high-performance dinghy sailors, there's an argument to be made that you top that list. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that's a pretty tough, tough argument to make. <laughs> um, it's flattering, but, uh, you know, there's so many good sailors. Uh, I wouldn't throw my name at the top of that list. Okay. Um, so we do start these out with a short answer um, sec section. Uh, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. P favorite place you've ever sailed? Uh, Lake Garda, Italy. Oh man, that's a big. That's that's. I think that's number one in all those short answers. And uh, what should maybe f different uh, place? A favorite place to train? Um, oh. uh, Sydney in the harbor. Oh wow. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah, when we sail four seventies, um, I sail with Mike Lee, and and the story there was, uh, Mike, you know, you could probably put Mike at the top of that list in terms of like best <laughs> sailors in Canada. He he might not have like a range of classes or or a long list of uh, Olympic medals or anything, but um, you know, just in terms of like his ability to kind of trailblaze in. A really, really difficult class, the laser, you know, getting a medal at the Worlds, um, coming out of nowhere. He, he's an incredible sailor. Um, and what ended up happening was um, going into uh, London, like almost two years out, we had a phenomenal laser team. We had probably like seven guys, um, all who were making Gold Fleet regularly. Um, and, uh, you know, oftentimes one or two of them would be in the medals. Mike would often medal it up um, at a World Cup event. Uh, Dave and Bernie were right there. Chris Dole, Lee Parkhill, myself. Um, and then there was like Ryan Mahaffey and Andrew Childs was there for a little while. Like there was just so many good guys. Shout out and, Nova Scotia. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, we... Uh, so... Going to 2012, Mike had a really bad back injury where he had like he's starting to get disc pain and he he couldn't um, he, like the hiking was really killing him and so he was kind of told that you know you should probably switch to a trapezing boat uh -huh. and uh, he said he obviously he thought about it for a long time but that was eventually where he said hey Luke I want to uh, what do you think about you driving me crewing and us sailing 470s. Um, and so that, that's in a story in and of itself, but, um, <laughs> our first, uh, our first month of training, I moved to Sydney and stayed with him and his wife, Kat, uh, in their little flat. And we sailed in Sydney Harbor every day, just by ourselves. Didn't know anything about, uh, we didn't personally, I didn't know anything about anything other than a laser really, you know, uh -huh. about tuning about whatever, but we had a blast and that's an unbelievable place to sail. Did you, you get, say that's a good way to get into a class like to just to spend a bunch of time by yourself to start with to kind of actually it doesn't sound like a good idea at all <laughs> probably not um to be honest i mean um the best way is probably to have a coach who uh knows the boat like it's got such a pedigree that having someone who's coached at you know, say a team that's made goal, like the level where a team that's made goal fleet. Um, and, you know, Nigel Cochran, who coached us in, oh, wow. um, in, uh, in the games, he's probably like an amazing coach for a brand new team because he just drills you on boat handling and maneuvering and that sort of stuff. In terms of setup and all that stuff, you probably want to go to a different coach 
so always like the coaching will depend on where you are in your development loop. Right. But I think um, you you don't want to do that, I think, because there's a lot of weird things, I think, with every boat, but 470 in particular, about it's been sailed for so long. So there's a way that you move through the boat and a way that you hook up the pole and the way that you do certain maneuvers. And sometimes you can just build, you can be, you can be tacking the wrong way. Oh, you're tacking forwards instead of backwards. You know, but, you know there's, sometimes there's no wrong way, but like you're probably not going to figure out the most efficient way. Yeah, yeah. By just going out and doing it on your own. But um, and so and it's a balance, right? Like we were trying to go to the Olympics, and so we were trying to shortcut things. Right. Um, if you were just like, oh, I've got four years, and you're trying to just you know figure out how to not to capsize, of course, that's a great way to start. You don't always need an engine running, right? Um, but uh, you know, if you're really trying to shortcut it, it's helpful to um, sail with people that know what they're doing, ask them questions. If you can get a coach, then that's great. Right? Um, yeah. It just appears uh, that maybe that is uh, to build a team. You know, to just go out and have fun for a little while and see yeah. if you like each other, see if it's fun. Um, might be a, a, a kind of a good starting spot. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, um, it depends where you are in your life, right? Like uh, um, right now, me having two kids, it, uh, and one's five months old, one's turning three next week. Oh, my God. And, you know, working full time, and um, my wife's a sailor. She's away uh, sometimes, um, and it's so hard to fit the time in. That whenever I sail, I am like hyper focused on making it efficient and good, you know, good gear, good team, good whatever. But when I was uh, like 14 years old or 15 years old, um, you know, I was a terrible opti sailor. I was awful. Um, That's good to and, know, kids. You can be a bad opti sailor and still succeed. Yeah, I think I started sailing like when I was 12 or so. And I kind of bounced around a little bit uh, and was always at the back of the fleet. But the, the, the team there was so great. I just had friends. And so I would kind of hang around. And what ended up happening was Mike, uh, the club hired a new coach, Al Clark, who's, who's a great guy, great coach, um, had a big influence on me growing up um, because Mike Lee was had a couple of decent results. And they said, oh, we should get a better coach who can help him up. And I just happened to start, he, Mike's four years older than me. So I happened to start in um, when they were sailing a lot. And uh, I ended up going out with them uh, or with whoever was there, like every day after school for kind of six months or something like that. And then all of a sudden I showed up to regatta. I wasn't last anymore. <laughs> I said, oh, this is pretty cool. And so for like two or three years, um, from when daylight savings would start to when daylight savings would end, I would just ride my bike down from school. Um, after school, I'd sail until the sun went down. Then I'd go home for dinner. And, uh, you know, no real plan. A lot of times, I'd some, most of the time, I'd try and make it as far out to the ocean as I could. Um, and then sometimes you'd end this up This is like, an opti you were doing this? No, this is in la uh, lasers. Okay. So I was like 14 at this point, 15. Uh, sometimes you'd end up paddling back or walking your boat into shore, walking home in the dark or whatever. Um, and then sailing every weekend with the team. And, you know, so there was no purpose. And, you know, there was, we had race team training and stuff like that. But um, just putting in, you know, it's so much time and really just wanting to, uh, whatever, you develop this like base of feel. And I think that allows you to, know how the boat should feel to be able to look around to you know know how to sail in waves all those things that are really hard to develop you you kind of need this huge base and so you know i think there was one day when i sailed or one year when i sailed like 110 days in a row or something like that oh my god um and so i'm in a totally different part of my life now than i was then and so to say like oh should you go out by yourself Absolutely, she go by herself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like there's, you know, I guess the advice that people give is very dependent on where they are and what they're doing, and so circumstantial that it's it's hard to like blanket things, make things black and white. Yeah, um, yeah. And so to say what 
we did in the 470 was right or wrong, it's hard to know. Um, yeah. But it was helpful, I think. I mean, uh, two things come to mind. Like I, my daughter, a couple of summers ago, and my son too, they, they would sail for 28 days in a row because they were going to sailing school and going to, similar to you, and then going to regattas. And, yeah, and yeah, I'd yeah. come out like, holy shit, these kids are faster than me now just because I haven't been able to. And that's yeah. happened to me a couple of times this year where it's been um, it's been light in the morning or whatever, the, the fleet's not going out. And I'm like, I'm going out sailing. Like I need every second that I have yeah, to that's like, awesome. train and figure out how to sail this boat because I'm not 15 and I can't just go out every day. So yeah, that's yeah. a good that's a good lesson for everybody. Uh, so still going through the short answers. Um, <laughs> it's cool though, it's good, this is all good. Um, do you have a sailing role model? Um, yeah, I, you know, it goes back to Mike Lee. He, when I was growing up, he was uh, being a couple years older and really having a good work ethic and trailblazing uh, like super high performance laser sailing in Canada. Um, he was he was kind of my um yeah the guy i looked to um and then so 20 2006 you win the youth worlds right yeah that's right yeah and that was in full rigs back then so 2006 i won 2005 was in korea i went um i came eighth um and i, I won a day but i was like yeah i didn't recognize that it was where the where the games were in 88 and I didn't recognize that it was just all right hand track until like the third day. I was so dumb. Oh wow! Um, but uh, actually, Giles Scott won that event. Um, okay. And we became friends there. He's a super great guy, great sailor, and you could kind of tell um, just the way that he like. I would ask him questions and stuff. We would go back and forth on things, and just the way that he kind of talked about things, you could tell. Oh, this guy's clicked in. And then Jean Baptiste um, was third there or was second there. Just won Worlds but, last year, right? Yeah, and uh, Rutger, who I think went to a couple of games in lasers, was third. So it was it was a stacked year. Um, uh, and then the year before that, I think John Romenko, he's from our club in Royal Van, he went. And then the two years before that, Mike went, and he was, yeah, he, he was right in there. I don't remember if he, he was definitely winning. I don't remember where he finished up, but uh, um yeah um so another question in the short answers uh main sheet cleats or not for a laser why and why not um i always sailed without them um but i think going back to it i started I, like after i sailed 470s i lost like 50 or 60 pounds um and then i would sail essentially exclusively um uh, whatever they're called, the radials, right. sixes, what the sixes they're called now, I think. Um, like I won a North Americans, um, when I was working a couple of years ago in the radials and the, I think then I used the cleats. Um, it kind of, whatever would come with the boat, I think, um, they are useful for some things like doing little repairs or like, yeah whatever um, they're kind of a pain in the butt to sit on i'm kind of agnostic if it comes with it i'll sail with it if it doesn't yeah i try not to get too worked up about little things like that i feel like it's really positive like you say for for repairs for like relaxing like if you on the way in if you get an hour-long sail on a close reach like it's nice <laughs> yeah, to have the yeah. cleats towing um, yeah and also for um you know, and this Lee said this actually doing lead, lead to lead jibes. You just cleat it on the yeah, side. Yeah, that's true. Actually, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, I think I would when I had no cleats, I'd have to hold the sheet in the tiller hand. But yeah, it was it was helpful. Yeah, everybody, you know, everyone's so down on them. Like nobody <laughs> in the high level uses them. Blah blah blah. But I just, you know, there's I, probably I won't put you know it like a, a toughness thing there. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, so, uh, do you have any nicknames? Uh, no. <laughs> but it says on your bio that you do. <laughs> oh, does it? Yeah. What does it say? Chef Luke. Oh, you know what? Lee gave me that nickname. <laughs> and he's like, oh man, that must have been 
so long ago now. Yeah, he used a Chef Ramsay, I think is oh, what Chef he called Ramsay, it. Oh, Chef Ramsay, yeah. Chef Ramsay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I, no one's called me that in probably 10 years. <laughs> Why was it Chef Ramsay? Uh, I was like getting into nutrition and stuff. Uh, and uh, Lee and I spent... I didn't really know Lee before this, but we were training for the Halifax Worlds and we pretty much spent the whole summer like inseparable training. We trained with a good team in Halifax. Paul Goodison and, and Nick Thompson came out and did a training camp and we had a great crew and we lived together and then in Halifax training there. And then we, when we weren't there, we would drive back to his parents' place in Oakville and uh, we trained there. We did, we did a uh, regatta. It was like a nationals or something there. Um, yeah, we were kind of inseparable for summer, great friends. And I was always doing the cooking. Oh, course, I see. You know, like, uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay, right? Uh, right. Oh, yeah, I see. That I was becoming, it. that was becoming a thing. And so that's where it came from. I think that is key too to success is having someone like that, that you're with all the time who, who's pushing you. Like, yeah, I remember, uh, one year I was sailing, you probably know these guys, um, Burn Nowak and um oh shit orlando gledhill does that ring him that bell? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. A bell. so i was sailing and i was going ar around a bit and they would they were staying together all the time and i billeted with them a couple of times and they were talking as they were falling asleep they were like so how far do you think the moon should be out and then when they woke up they were still talking like the first thing out of their mouth was about how to sail a laser faster so I yeah think that's pretty you know, good I, I think um that before that uh, despite it having some success, uh, I think I was so freaking competitive when I was a kid that I found it hard to, um, share anything. You know how you're a little bit immature, share anything or like really be so open to asking all the like kind of stupid questions that, um, you know, you, it kind of hinders your development a little bit and you're just so competitive. You don't want anybody to like figure out your secrets and, and it was really that summer that I learned so much. And uh, Lee and I were just completely open with each other uh, about and like actively trying to make each other better, you know, right. which is a big part of it. Um, and I think we both learned a lot and, and we both grew as sailors and people in learning that, you know, the, the key is not to hide your secrets, but to like expose them, give them to the other person, they get better, then they use those against you. And then you have to turn like get better than them. And you know, there's this whole, um, it's that kind of back and forth struggle that rings you up the, the ladder. Um, that and, is sorry, that that's something almost everybody I've had in the podcast that I've asked the question, like, how what would you what kind of advice would you give people almost everybody says ask questions? Yeah. 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 Of course. I mean, um, I mean, just, you know, looking at the lightning stuff, uh, for example, like, I mean, I've, I've been in many different classes and, uh, there's, there's no formula to, to figuring it out, but at least you got to figure out how, what, what are the things that other people n know? Right. And I, I had a list of like 50 questions and I was just like emailing the class secretary and she was connecting me with the world champion. And I was calling, you know, uh, people that, um, I knew had sailed the boat and asking them this list of questions and going through things. And, you know, your, your thinking kind of iterates over time. You do this with multiple different people over and over and over again. And it's amazing how open people are to spend 20 minutes on the phone with you. Um, and, you know, I think the biggest thing is not presuming that you know anything um, and just, you know, like really asking the most simple, basic questions um, because you'll be really surprised by the answer sometimes. And then if you if the answer surprises you, well, then there's something there. Right. So you kind of go down this rabbit hole. Why would that be? Oh, um, why doesn't why don't they vang sheet in this boat, for example. Oh, uh, maybe it's because they've got no support down low in the mast, and so it overbends the bottom. Or uh, maybe they use the traveler. Or, you know, like um, there's all these things that you can um, you can start to play at. It's like it's those like differences um, that you really are like uh, you can spend time on. And once you figure out why, you know, you ask the question, something's different. You start to think about it and figure out why. You've learned so much. 
that now if the conditions change or you're sailing a different type of boat or whatever, you can then apply the same kind of things to that, that new thing that you're doing. Whereas if you're just, you know, stuck in your own zone and you never really figure out the why you might figure out how to make this one boat go fast, but it's really hard to translate it. Wow. That's yeah. good. That's good advice. We should all like venture to ask one stupid question a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause it's hard. Yeah. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. I, you, you learn, uh, to get good at it. Um, you know, like I, so right now I work in property development. Um, and the nice thing about being in that is you are the, you're always the client. So you're hiring all these consultants and they're paid to answer your stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally do it for a job. Right. Right. And so I'm used to being the dumbest guy in the room and just always asking the stupid questions, but you know, you learn the fundamentals and, um, once you know, or at least have a grasp on the fundamentals, um, it just makes everything so much easier. Things start to make sense, you know? Right. Well, why do you yeah. think I have this podcast? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not paying you. I actually, I'm paying uh, Luke a great sum of money to be on this podcast. Oh, perfect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, all right, we're all over the place, but let's talk about the 2016, uh, quad with the NACA yep. 17s. So first of all, uh, let's talk about your crew. Who's absolute legend. Yeah. Uh, Nicola Gerke, is, yeah. she's what she's done five Olympics in three different classes. The last time she was the oldest member, not of this, not of just the sailing team, but she was the oldest member of the Canadian Olympic team in yeah, 2020. Amazing. So yeah. what can you tell me about her and about, um, connecting with her as a partner? Um, well, we, so we were teammates in 2012 in London and, uh, I, you know, sailing with her was a big part of why I wanted to do the NACRA. It was a new class and I was probably a little naive. Um, I didn't realize how much I think the tornado, um, the knowledge from that class would have percolated down, like just being catamarans. So I kind of thought, oh, there's a brand new class. No one's going to know anything about the boat. <laughs> We're going to like, we're going to be starting in the exact same spot as everybody else. And I think we can figure this out faster. Um, that being said, we were, we were actually way behind when we started just because we didn't have years and years of catamaran experience. So mm -hmm. we had a big learning curve, but sailing with Nicola was a big part of why I wanted to do that class. Um, you know, I, what you said speaks for itself. She's, just, um, she's a legend in, you know, Canadian sport and windsurfing and, uh, um, she's just an extremely hard worker. Um, like she, especially, you know, on the boat, he, she will burn herself out. Like she'll take it all the way. You know, those people who can like really access that last little part of like their psyche and then just be like absolutely destroyed at the end of the day. Cause they gave like a hundred percent. That was totally Nicholas. She's like, she's really, um, really strong works really hard super committed um and also good at all those little things that i probably wasn't good at like um uh you know like taking care of details on the boat like doing all the marks and making sure we we could have a really good tuning guide and um being really good with like keeping people in touch and um like having a following during our campaign doing helping with fundraising like she made our campaign go round in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, uh, whereas Mike and I, we were so similar when we were sailing together that everything was like being doubled up. Ah. Know? I would do the tuning, he'd do the tuning again. You know? <laughs> uh, he, he, like we were just so overlapped. Whereas Nicola and I had a little bit more like um, our campaign was more broad. And I think we, um, we touched a lot different things. And um, we, you know, I learned so much during that campaign. It was, it was really cool just to sail a boat that is completely unlike anything I'd ever sailed before, um, to be doing a class tactically that was, uh, um, like all about boat speed and breeze and not so much about shift. And, um, uh, it, you know, it was, it was great. And Sailor Nicola was, was really cool. She, you know, don't have enough good things to say about her. That's cool. I, I feel like catamarans get the short end of the stick uh, among our sport in general. 
Um, and uh, like I'd ask people, what's wrong with a Hobie 16? Ah, it just looks stupid. Um, <laughs> but I, I sailed in a, a, a catamaran for like five minutes and I was like, oh, I'm never going back to lasers. This is too <laughs> yeah. much fun. Um, yeah, it's so fun. I mean, it's like that. I get to ask this question at like every, I do a lot of different boats. Like today, um, I'm there. We're at the in, we're, we're at Annie's parents' place in Wisconsin, and at Lake Geneva, uh, like 45 minutes away, is the inlands. It's called the Big Inland. So they have four classes, and they're all scows, which are like these funny flat bottom, flat nose boats. And I'm sailing MCs uh, in the morning, so they do like morning and afternoon, and then sea boats in the morning. So MCs one person, sea boats two people. My wife's driving in the afternoon, and I'm um, I'm crewing for her. Um, she's a great sailor, far better than I am. Um, and uh, um, and at every regatta I go to, people ask me this question: oh, Okay, so what is the um, w- w- you know like isn't this the best class? What do you think of this class? <laughs> and like the thing is, every single class probably most people in there think it's the best class, but also it has its things that make it so great. Um, and, you know, if you're sailing a moth, you know, people are going to say, oh, it's so pure because it's every aspect. You get to learn how to build a boat and how to tune it and how to do all this. And that's what makes a great sailor. And if you sail a laser, you go, oh, no, it's the most pure because you you don't even need to know how to sheet a main sheet. You just pull it all the way <laughs> until it's too blocked. And it's all about tactics, you know, like uh, and so you can go. So every class has that. And that's what makes every class great is because it takes a different skill set. And you have to learn how to how to deal with that and how to um, how to figure out the boat. And um, sometimes, yes, it's just tactically, uh, and or sometimes it's just technique, and sometimes it's all setup. And that's the cool thing about the sport is it's like it just takes so many different dimensions that um, uh, that you just are more rounded, you know. And then you show up, and a you don't know who's going to be there, and b it might be five knots or it might be 35 knots. And now you've got <laughs> yeah. a completely different sport altogether, totally. which brings yeah, me absolutely. to um, this idea of performance goals versus process goals, right? And we all say, or people try to say that every regatta, you're just trying to get better, try to get better at one thing. But certainly, I guess when you get into the Olympics, it's got to be all performance goal, right? At that point. Mm-hmm. So how do you go uh, about that? Oh, man, that's a... <laughs> That's a big question. Um, uh, yeah, obviously I've spent like a whole career trying to figure that out. Oh, good. <laughs> and I, I don't know if there's a right answer. Um, I think um, the the key, I think really the key is when you are racing, so forget like what your intent is going into it or what your whatever, your mind has to be 100% focused on what you're doing, right? Like um, if you've ever read The Inner Game of Tennis, which is like my favorite sports book ever, yeah, it, it's all about, you know, like where is your focus and trying to a lot of times take out your overthinking brain. And so regardless of everything you do, in preparation in planning and this and that if you have this like very intense focus on what you're doing during the racing and during the prep um you are i think that's how you're going to set up now with that being said um in terms of like prep i think the mistake you can make if you're all about performance is like, oh, I don't want to do too much. You know, I don't want to get up too early because I don't want to be too tired, you know. And I think if you're in that learning mindset um, where you're just like, oh, we're just trying to absorb and get better, you're learning about more about the conditions on that day. You know, you're getting out a little bit earlier. You're doing more timed runs to the start. You're um, you're not too afraid to experiment a little bit with your tuning setup. Um and usually when you're experimenting with your tuning setup, you're not just doing it because you're like, oh, I want to just do this. You're um, like, I heard this was cool. You're like, oh, something feels weird. And so I think it might be better to try this. And inevitably, that's usually a really good thing to do. And usually you can undo it, right? Um, do you want to do that at the games? Maybe not. You know, you probably, probably at like big events, you want to make things a little more simple for yourself. 
um, because there's so much going on. There's so much auxiliary stuff that boiling it down, like, makes it a little bit better but that being said you know you probably don't want to change too much from what you've been doing and so it's a hard thing i don't know if there's a right answer um or if uh yeah but i guess we're i think the good people are always learning you know um whether or not they have the goal of of one thing or another it's hard to say, but they're always learning. They're always asking questions. They're always debriefing every day. Um, those things are definitely important. Right. Wow. Because yeah. I think for for most people, they're like, I want to win this regatta or I want a cup top 10 at this regatta. But if you right. change that mindset, like I had Sarah Douglas on when she just won Yale and she was like, oh, I was just trying to get better at downwind and find out where <laughs> I was. And she yeah. like won half the races. So, you know, that is a good mindset all the way to the top, I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, some people, um, they put a sh so much pressure on themselves and that can really help. Right. And some people, they need that. Like my wife is a good example, right? She, she great sailor. She won the test event in four seventies, so many world cup medals. Um, and, uh, she went to the games in, in 2016 and 470s and she has the mindset that um, she should win every single race. Yeah. Like she has the expectation of herself and if she doesn't, she's so mad. Like yesterday we were sailing together and we were, um, we were in like third or something. And then we, it was really tricky when all over the place we had to kind of we were seeing the race course in different ways and having a kind of debate up the up the last beat and we dropped a couple of places and she was so mad like inconsolably mad so competitive <laughs> like if she's not winning she will like bite your head off and so for some people they're like that like ben ainsley you know that guy he's not thinking about getting better going down he's thinking about winning every single regatta so you know, it just depends who you are and, and your approach. Everyone's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, how did you lose 50 pounds? <laughs> uh, I was, I was a real idiot about it. I mean, I, there was like probably like a two week stretch or so that I didn't eat. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're just like so amped about something that you'll just like do anything to make it happen. Um, that was kind of my mentality was like, oh, we are gonna, we're gonna go and we're, gonna, you know, we're coming from lasers, which is the hardest class, you know, like you have this stupid mentality and we're going to smash everybody. All we need to do is get down to weight. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that's like a hundred percent wrong. But when you're in it, that was like my focus. And so essentially I was on, I went into like a, a sub a thousand calorie a day diet for a couple of months until I lost the weight didn't do it in a good way. Um, it wasn't eating the right things. Um, but it was just like, just get the muscle off, you know? So it was just like muscle atrophy, right. super unhealthy. Um, probably would not recommend. <laughs> so you, you, when you were racing, like how much do you weigh now? Uh, right now I'm around 160. I put on some weight last year for sale GP. Yeah. Okay. So that's your kind of natural do you even have a natural weight at this point? Yeah, no, yeah, I don't. <laughs> like when I was, uh, before I started losing the weight, I was doing the Perth pre-worlds in um, lasers and I was like 190. Um, and uh, in 470s during the games, I think I was around 130. Um, so now- Not everyone can do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and on top of that, like what you just said about, you know, that it was the wrong thing. A lot of people really get hung up on their weight. Like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm 195, so I can't sell a laser. You know, I'm never going to get, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's the tough thing is it's part of the sport. And um, I always say you want to be fleet average, you know. And I have been one over over the years to obsess about weight. Um, because it matters. Right. Um, and, but there's nothing you can do about it once the regatta starts. And so that's really where you, I think you have to shift your focus. You know, you can, you can focus on it in training and you can try and get bigger, try and get smaller. But once the regatta starts, you have to put that out of your mind because it's only going to hurt you.
You were on the inaugural season of, of CLGP Canada. Um, and uh, so tell me about that experience. What's it like? How did you get involved with it? What's it like to sail on, a, on, a, on an F-50? And, and what, you're, what you're doing about it now or what your situation is now? Yeah, um, it was cool. Um, I, how did I get involved with it? I think because I knew Tyler from the 2012 games and he kind of helped start uh, the whole thing. Um, I got a call from them right and the yeah it was it was just like oh do you want to be involved and it was a very tough decision for me because uh, to be involved meant like quitting my job which i was super committed to super happy with um and uh, you know i just felt like oh it was such a good opportunity it was so cool you know tip of the spear of the sport and um uh you know, something you watch on TV and I thought, oh, my window for to doing this is kind of closed. That was what I was thinking, watching this from the sidelines. Like, oh, I just kind of missed this, you know, if I had a slightly different career path or did made slightly different decisions, I could be up there. But uh, so when I got the call, I was so, so surprised uh, that Canada was going to have a team and that uh, I might be on the team um, that... I ended up uh, quitting my job and, and going and doing it. Um, and it was really cool. Like they built a great bro program in that we did a lot of sailing on GC 32s, right. uh, which are a great platform, super fun boat, really competitive. Um, and the, you know, other sail GP teams, especially the kind of newer ones were doing the same thing. And so we had good training groups. And so most of January, February, March, uh, up until the first season was spent um, doing, uh, say, GC32 stuff and then simulator stuff for the F50s. Um, and in, uh, like, right before, like 10 days before the first GC32 camp, I had a bad ski crash. I, like, um, went off this cliff that uh, I didn't really know was there. <laughs> I, it was like a new run. I'd never done it before. And it kind of looked like a rise. And I was like, oh, it should be fine. And it ended up being a big cliff. And I landed on a flat. And I ended up um, fracturing my femur and my tibia. Oh, my God. My, yeah, tearing my ACL um, fully. And then having a partial tear in my MCL, my PCL, and my LCL. And um, at the time, like, it, we were kind of, like, in the middle of nowhere. And we got taken to this, like, crappy hospital with no x-rays or anything and they just kind of felt it and they're like oh yeah like maybe you have like an mcl strain and i was obviously like completely immobile kind of like limping around um for the next couple of days when my wife went skiing um and i was watching <laughs> and you kids. didn't know you had two broken bones in your leg yeah well they were like um they were like compression factors in both and they were undisplaced so there wasn't like bones floating around um so there wouldn't require surgery. But um, when I got back, I was like, okay, I have 10 days till the first GC32 camp. Like, I just have to rehab this thing, thinking it was like some sort of like pulled, I don't know, late. Like, I thought it was like, because I had torn my AC MCL before, but not fully. I was like, oh, okay, it's probably the same thing. And my physio was like checking out. And she's like, oh, you know, like there could be some ACL stuff. Like, you should probably get an MRI. And I couldn't get an MRI before I left. So I went to the first camp and I just like taped it up, you know, like pretty much was like <laughs> kind of like <laughs> limping around the boat stiff. Like it's so painful, so sore. Um, and uh, and then when I got back after like two weeks of sailing GC32s, which is like incredibly hard boats to sail, I got an MRI and I was like, oh my God, my knee is destroyed. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, the common thing is like, okay, go get surgery, um, for your ACL. But I was so determined, like, no, I'm going to make this, this, uh, F50 team that, uh, I just was like, fuck it. I'll just do it as it is. And, uh, I'll just wear a brace, like brace it up, tape, tape it up, it up do whatever brace it up. Do. Yeah. <laughs> and so I did that, um, uh, for a long time and it was a little bit frustrating it, it was it was like one of the most emotional things in my sailing career because you could never trust your leg 
sometimes you'd be running across the 50 and your leg would give out. And then, oh. you know, like you would I'd be like, oh, incredibly bad pain. You'd have to like get up and like limp over to the other side and then like just like grit the day out. And then at the end of the day, your knees all swollen. And it was like, it, you know, it was just, it was, it was like really hard um, just mentally to deal with all that. Um, but I just had, again, I had this mindset similar to when I was losing weight, like you just have to do this. Like no matter what, you just like, you have to make it through. Um, and things are always like this, you know, like if you just do like, okay, one minute, another minute, another minute, another minute, like as you build, you're like, okay, it's been a year. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, uh, you know, eventually, so what ended up happening was, um, with the, with the team, I was doing the sailing and, um, uh, and I didn't, and so they've pegged me for flight control with Billy and, uh, Billy, uh, got the call up for the first event. And, um, like before that we were switching off doing training and stuff like that. And he did a great job. The team did awesome. Right. They podiumed at the first event. Yeah. And after that, it was like, oh, my window for trying to regain that spot has now like narrowed to almost nothing. <laughs> oh, okay. And my, my wife was pregnant. Um, with a second kid and I was being away like three months out of the, um, out of the month or three weeks out of the month. And so just being away so much, um, not making any money, uh, not doing exactly what I wanted to do. It was kind of like, uh, yeah, I should probably go back to my job. (laughs) Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, but it was a great group of guys. It was super fun. The boats are incredible. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty pretty special, and now I just kind of say, oh, I just took a, sub- a year sabbatical. Okay, you know, they gave me my job back at least. It wasn't the end of the world. It was really okay. fun. Okay. And in uh, in October, I got ACL surgery, um, and I'm pretty much back to 100 percent now, which is great. I'm glad to hear that story because for those of us on the outside, I didn't know about the injury. Thought something terrible. I thought you just like you know broken ties somehow. Not no, amicably. you know. Yeah. I mean, the injury I tried to, I didn't tell anybody like I was like, oh yeah, my knee's a little sore (laughs) because, because I didn't want them to not give me a shot on the boat. Um, and then I ended up telling Phil and the team, uh, before they made the selection for the, uh, for the first event, because I didn't want to be, I didn't want to like be, uh, like I thought they should judge me by my sailing, but they also should know if there was like an injury risk. Right. Um, and so that is, that, yeah, but, uh, no, I mean, um, it's always this way you just get busy, you know, so you don't, once you're out, you're out, uh, there's other things to do. And, um, I, you know, I hope they do well. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I think I remember, uh, in one of those early videos, because like you said, when the sail GP Canada came up for those of us into it, like, it was like, Holy crap. I watched every video, every second of every video. And I think there was one where you and Billy were going to go out and you said, one, you guys said to each other, like, aren't we doing the same thing? Like, like you had to f- see who was going to get to do that spot just in training. Yeah. 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 yeah that was, that was tough. I mean, to be, it was tough for me because you, in my mind, I was better, right? And I think this is just the mentality. I'm sure he thought the same thing. You have this mentality. <laughs> like, I am I'm the best at this. Um, you have this kind of confidence. And uh, it's hard to be... Anytime you're, select, you're not selected for something based on, like, pure opinion, you know, one person is going to feel slighted, Right. Whereas if it was like, okay, we're going to put you in a flight control regatta and you lose, like Uh, same thing with losing the trials to Lee. You're like, oh man, I'm really pissed, but I lost and that's fair. So there's always like, um, there's always going to be that little bit of, uh, of like, ah, you're always just a little frustrated because, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a call. It's a, you know, maybe weight had a big part to do with it and he's a bigger guy. Maybe, uh, team dynamic, you know, maybe I'm a big I'm an asshole. Nobody. Else <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, y- there could be all these other things, right? And so um, that was definitely a tough pill to swallow. And you know, every, everyone that races at any level really is going to have these times in their sailing career when they 
swallow some really tough pills. Um, but you know, it's those really lows that make the highs, you know, make the successes that much better. It's like parenting. You know, I think the reason why <laughs> parenting is so like people are like, Oh yeah, having kids is the best is because <laughs> times when it's the worst, yeah. you know, like it give what it does is it, it like creates these valleys and these highs. So you get like, you have like actual depth to your life, you know, like you wouldn't know how great it is to be able to, uh, I don't know, go run a 10 K if you're, if you haven't been with a broken leg, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> limping around, like it's, uh, it's these lows that make the contrast with the highs and, uh, everyone goes through that and it's, you know, that's part of life. Right. Right. All right. So onto the three big questions. What do you love about sailing? Um, uh, so that, the answer to that has evolved over the years a lot for me. Um, so what I would say now is very different when I was a kid, you know, when I first started, what I loved about it was I had great friends in the fleet. And then when I started developing a little bit more, I loved going out by myself. You know, I loved the kind of freedom of like, uh, just being able to go out after school by myself. And there's a bit of an unknown. You might get stuck in the wrong tide and get sucked out to the ocean, you know? Um, and it happened. Um, but there was like that just total freedom. Um, and then as I got a little bit older, it was probably like, you're good at something. And, uh, um, that in and of itself is like, you know, everybody's, nobody's good at everything, you know? So you kind of pick what you're good at and the, uh, the, the ability to like get better, you know, that feeling of like, I'm improving and I'm, that is addictive. You know, people chase that their whole lives. Um, and then, uh, I would say, you know, now what I really love about it is, uh, just like the multidimensionality of it. it pretty much every time I sail a boat, it's a different boat. Um, like the MCs that I'm sailing today, I've only sailed them once. Uh -huh. Um, and this is like their biggest event of the year. And it's so cool to be able to show up. And while you're beating, trying to figure out the wind, you're also trying to figure out how to tune the boat or how to sail it. Um, and so I end up even now getting, spending a lot of time getting my butt kicked, right? Like a lot of time struggling. Um, but it's that kind of process and the learning that is so fun being able to like, people are so open in every class. It seems like, you know, especially if you're new, especially if you're getting your butt kicked, you can just go and ask people questions and they'll just share their thoughts. And it's that kind of learning process that, um, probably is what, what I love most at the moment. That's excellent answers. All three. Um, and, uh, what are you most proud of in your sailing career? Um, I don't know. I never really thought about it. <laughs> um, uh, I, I guess the things I'm most happy with are, um, Probably, probably meeting my wife. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm constantly surprised at that answer because, uh, at that question, because I always think someone's going to say, oh, and I podied in here or, <laughs> yeah. you know, oh, and I did this, that, and the third, but that's always something really interesting when, when someone at that level talks about that. Like me, for example, because the podcast's all about me, uh, <laughs> I I started like kind of running this race team, not coaching it, but here in New Brunswick. Oh, cool! And uh, we put together this uh, this um, seminar, four day seminar. Uh, none of these kids had ever like spent a whole day really, you know, learning to race. And we had um, uh, Ali. Um, oh my God, Ali Ali Surrett was one of the coaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Alex Sapp was the other. And these kids, they learned so much in four weeks, in four days. And they, like, got uh, a um, got role models, people that have been to, you know, at the highest level of the sport. And, like, holy shit, sailing's really cool. So I, I'm most proud of that, of putting the, that, those four days together. That's awesome. Um, and then what kind of advice would you have for developing sailors at any age? Um, I think... We, you know, not to beat that horse, but number one thing is get on the water, 
you know. Um, and the number two thing is just be open, ask questions, and try things. Um, that's that's pretty much it. If you do that consistently over years, then you'll go from the bottom to the top. <laughs> that's great. Luke Ramsey, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been fascinating. I could talk to you for another three hours, but I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for the time, Dave. Talk to you soon. Yep. So as I say, sail fast, have fun, make friends. I'll see you on the water.